I'm Tim, welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. You are watching Watches Tonight. This evening, I answer your questions, chat live, and I share viewer wrist shots from around the world. Edward Ledden in the box, Matt Foster, Joseph Z from California, or Toshar from New York City. This is a live program. Ask questions, ask them often, it's interactive. But remember to check out the redesigned homepage of thewatchbox.com, updated several times a day. If you've seen it, you're already behind the curve. You need to open it up, different window, keep me streaming, and check out what changed. All right, creative work, like that website, evolves over time. Anyone who sees disturbingly weird early Simpsons episodes comments on how crude it looked and how repulsive the characterizations themselves were. They were not lovable. Also, as I approach my eighth year in the watch industry, I've taken the opportunity to look back at some of my early work. I think that's my first ever watch review right there. And I've unearthed, amid all the crude hands-on videos, my first YouTube appearance of any kind. Surprisingly, my first video actually showed my face instead of my hands. It wasn't exactly the start of a franchise, unless that franchise was fast food, for which I was clearly dressed. Hey, back in the Watch You Want era, we were all about branding, so you wouldn't forget. Find it on Watchbox Studios after the stream and check it out. I'm perversely still pretty proud of the delivery, considering we had the money and the time for one pass and no edits. All right, let's see who's in the box right here. We got other friends. Jim Millet joining in, John N., Kevin Dye, Simon Holt, Mateo C., Enrique Cassiano, Richard Combs from South Florida. Richard, you're in our wrist shots tonight. Kevin Dye, Mark S. from Brooklyn, Scott Wexlin, our local boy from Chester, Pennsylvania, Ethan Davis, Random Rob, Lloyd Kerr. We got Radu joining in from Romania. Thank you for staying up late and content. Continental Europe and lots of friends. Simon Holt from Northern Ireland and Derek D. London from Wimbledon. All right, guys, as we jump into the show, I asked you answered. Before we roll with our wrist shots, let me remind you when you send me wrist shots, now also send me your Instagram handle so I can tag you. So, viewer wrist shots number one, starting with our man in the box, Richard C. from South Florida. Keeps two times with his Patek Philippe 5524G, Calatrava Pilot, and Porsche 911 Targa, looking good, Richard. Jack Z, and a real Flamingo, not the lawn variety. Admire his Patek Calatrava 6119G at a zoo fundraiser. I hope it was fruitful. Francisco G of San Antonio, Texas, posts a his and hers that's all green and all Rolex. And Mr. Sean of Hertfordshire, England, rolls with his Rolex Datejust mint green, in this case, and his Mercedes-Benz EQA. I'm in S of Texas, hits the road with BMW and a new Rolex GMT Master II VTNR, sometimes known as the Sprite. Send your wrist shots and remember your Instagram tag to mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on my pixels. Who's joining in? We've got Marcos V from Mexico City. We've got Burbinghard from Seattle, Michael M. from San Diego on America's left coast, Norm M. saying, Tim, good day. How do I see the broadcast from the beginning? It'll post recorded after the stream. You can watch it from the beginning then. It'll be up in syndication, so to speak. What else is going on? We've got Miroslav joining in from Europe. We got Tariq Chowdhury joining in from New York. Sean Hansen, Marcus K. from Malta. That might be a first for us. And Burning Mr. B. from Holland asking my thoughts on the Chapek Kedeberg white enamel dot what do I think? I think it's great. I think it's even better that it's got chronode behind it to provide parts and service for the next 12 years. Good watch, fun brand. If you want to know your watchmaking folks, choose Chapek. They're all a lot of fun from the CEO down, very approachable people. Okay, so questions and answers. You have questions, I have answers. One of them was about Chapek, but a common thread that I get from you guys, and so this is not a question from one, but a question from many, stated, I'm burned out on mainstream watches. Show me something different. Well, you asked, I've answered, and I'm starting with Glasuta Original. Maybe not the most glamorous brand in Germany these days, but definitely the oldest. And clawing their way out of the depths of communism in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, the company began to take on high horology in the 1990s, and by 2000, it was ready to make a statement. And it did, with the Geo Pano Retrograph. 39.4 millimeters, you can get it in white gold or platinum as a limited edition or regular production in rose gold. None of these watches were common. So 39.4 with caliber 60 
0.01. Take a good look because this is as good as it gets. A dizzying array of details, fine finish and colors, doing things no other watch had ever done up to this point. What does it do? I'm glad you asked. Can we go back to the dial side? This here is a programmable countdown timer. But it's not just that, it's also a flyback chronograph. But it's not just that, it also chimes the intervals as it runs down. Meaning it is all of those things plus a chiming programmable countdown timer. Lateral clutch, column wheel, immaculately hand finished and wearable on any wrist because of its compact size. Prices remain quite fair for this Dotograph killer. It is scarcer than any version of Longus Flyback Chronograph. And I have to say, all things considered, it flies well under the radar. It's attractive in every metal and a precious example of Glossuta Original showing what it can do when it steps out from under Longus shadow. Again, that's very little money for what you're getting. That kind of money is what people were paying for steel Daytonas like two months ago. Okay. Another Swatch Group brand, but as you've not seen it before, or at least probably haven't seen it before, Omega. Here's one well beyond the mainstream, the Seamaster Aquaterra XXL. So this is a small second Aquaterra XXL. They made in 2010, 88 pieces in white gold and in rose gold. They're both exquisite, but they're both huge. 49.2 millimeters in diameter with a 150 meter water resistance rating. It is a curious sports watch dress watch hybrid. It uses the COSC certified manual caliber 2211, which is Unitas based and an unusual COSC adaptation. A movement with a 53 hour power reserve, blackened bridges with a lovely spiral graining, a highly finished, highly adjusted chronometer grade version of something rare rarely seen in Omega watches as they've rarely used the ETA Unitas 6498 or 6497. And because of its pocket watch origins, this movement is properly sized to fit the case back of a near 50 millimeter watch. This Omega is a giant dress piece with gorgeous 19th century style. The dial is two piece grand faux enamel in white. You can see the hands are modified Breguet, the Breguet loops being replaced with little Omega logos. You can see inside the hands, the Omega logo fire blued, the dial with lovely pre art deco numerals. Really, these are, these are pocket watch style numerals from the 19th or early 20th century. The Omega logo and the Seamaster script likewise rendered in a vintage fashion with the Omega logo being true vintage and the Seamaster being sort of a what if like an MBNF legacy machine. That is what if there were a Seamaster back then. It is a chronometer as noted in elaborate script underneath the Omega logo. And again, everything about this watch is unusual right down to the rosette cut of the second piece of the dial within the small seconds. At $26,000 12 years ago, this watch was built and priced like haute horlogerie and there are so few examples of Grand Faux Dial Omega watches in circulation. Time Hill saying, I like those Omega numerals. We have Mark S saying, the Omega logo on the hands is too much, but it's easy to miss. Tell me you would have seen it if I hadn't pointed it out. What else is going on? Jim Millet saying, never seen this Omega before. That is why Tim is a personal favorite. I I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for all you guys who tune in. Let's try to get 300 simultaneous viewers. So if you're watching me now, stay with me because this show's only going to get better. Right here, Rick on watch is saying XXL indeed and Enrique saying, oh wow. This is an incredible watch, but it gets better. We're going big and we're going high end with Piaget and the Emperador Cousin. XL 700P. Can we go full screen here? So this was the concept drawing. The watch, a Phantom, released in 2016 and never heard from again. Ostensibly a 40th anniversary tribute to the in-house 1976 Piaget quartz caliber 7P. What this turned into was something of a Seiko spring drive, albeit from Switzerland, with a micro rotor winding a 42 hour power reserve 
a mainspring barrel, driving a unidirectional governing wheel, creating an induced electrical current, waking up a quartz oscillator, and governing the release of mechanical energy to the hands through a mechanical drivetrain. If that sounds like spring drive, yeah, exactly. An automatic power reserve indicator, quartz regulator, and a spring drive type technology. This watch definitely appeared at SIHH. I know because I was there and I saw it, but I have never seen one in the wild. There was no follow-up from Piaget. There were no successive versions of this watch, and this one was a limited edition of 118 pieces in white gold. It never came back in steel, rose gold, in platinum, or yellow gold. There were no other uses of this movement in dress watches or sports watches, and there's been precious little communication about this watch from Piaget. I've never seen one in a boutique or at a retailer, and here at Watchbox, where I see everything, including Philippe Dufour's used, I've never encountered one of these, leading me to wonder whether they actually sold any of them. What went wrong? Did Caliber 700P fail to operate properly? Could they just not tackle the beast? Or was Piaget sued by Seiko? I've never been able to determine what happened to this project. It remains one of the great mysteries in the watch world. 46.5 millimeters in white gold, and you can see the power reserve is on the reverse side, makes this one hell of a saucer on your wrist. So, heck, not everyone could have worn it, but you would have thought there'd be enough people in the world to sell 118 of them, especially in six years. It was announced at $70,800, which didn't make it any easier an argument to a client who might have been skeptical when you can get the same thing for under a thousand bucks from Seiko. What happened? Piaget, reach out to me. Monday mailbag at thewatchbox.com. We can go offline and sidebar. All right, jumping back into our box, Mark S. saying he's not a fan of the Breguet numerals on the Omega. That Omega was provocative. I'm still getting comments about that Omega in here. What else is going on? Jimmy Lane saying that Piaget, a little busy though, and I don't disagree with you. We have Landon Meyer, still no micro rotor in the collection, was enticed by the Baltic MR01. This Piaget is unique saying it's something you as in Y-O-U, as in it's a Tim Masso kind of watch, and you're not wrong. Brick Lane saying Piaget watches are pure class for wine connoisseurs. Joe Pinto, just joining us, is joining from Louisville, Kentucky. What else is going on? We got Pontiff, almost made it for the beginning of the show. Hi, from Minneapolis, and we got some commentary from Brick Lane. Show some pieces from JLC, Tim. Did you read my mind? What else is going on in the box? We got the watch goat saying he's a fan of the Maso Show, best live show on YouTube. I should also say that's easy to do because it is one of the few live watch shows on YouTube. So it's a small crowd. Ian S. joining from Greece and Shane D. from Oregon. All right. Hermes Slim Dermes Contien Perpetuel Platine. This is a watch that came out in rose gold in 2015, in platinum in 2017, and frankly, a lot of folks don't know it exists. Sean, can we go full screen with this one? The details matter. Custom typeface, the font is used only on this watch, and so important on watches. The font is used, I should say, both the letters and the numerals are used everywhere letters and numerals appear. Sometimes watch brands include two or three fonts and typeface on the same dial. No fail here, Hermes knows what it's doing. This is a gorgeous watch. At 39.5 millimeters in platinum, the combined movement with the Agenor manufactured perpetual calendar and the Vaucher-based micro rotor, only four millimeters thick for the entirety of the movement, perpetual and micro rotor. Case, dial, movement, and strap through Hermes's own resources as it owns every faculty necessary to produce a watch, including a substantial stake in Vaucher, the movement arm of Parmigiani. Agenor, of Jean-Marc Viderecht fame. They've created an entry in the Harry Winston Opus series, and they're responsible for the complication in this watch. It's more than just a micro rotor perpetual calendar that's slim and platinum. It's also a GMT. It has a lovely aventurine moon phase. Again, details matter. And if you look just below the hands there, you can see the second time zone in 12 hour format. We've got a mother of pearl moon phase on an aventurine glass moon phase base. And you can see there's even a concentric pattern inside the registers. And if you look very closely, you can see that the hands are half frosted and the sub-register hands are entirely frosted. 
details matter. Two-tone double blue dial. Note that the inner dial is a different blue than the outer dial. Nothing overlooked with a razor slim bezel that matches the thickness of the lugs because again, these things matter. The little pusher down at four o'clock is used for indexing the second time zone, which has a lovely little varnished red hash on it. And there's a cruciform symmetry to the dial that makes it beautifully regular. You can cut it vertically or bilaterally. This is a beautifully laid out watch in every regard from a brand that doesn't get enough credit for its watchmaking. A lot of folks still think of Hermes. They think of leather goods and accessories. Well, one of those accessories should be watches. I don't know if you can hear the alarm in the background, but that's not us, don't worry. Philadelphia's finest at work keeping us safe. So what does it cost to step into a Platinum Perpetual Calendar GMT from Hermes? $39,900, but frankly, I think for what you get, it's not a bad bargain. All right, viewer wrist shots number two, I asked you answered. Guys, if you send me viewer wrist shots, give me your Instagram handle so I can tag you properly. No name, he has no name. And I'm not gonna guess. He hits the road in his Subaru WRX STI with his AP Royal Oak. I think that is a 15400. He has no name, but outstanding taste in cars and watches. Teddy M and Baby Archer celebrate Father's Day with the Walbrook Skin Diver World Time Chronograph. Wear it in good health. May both of you long live and prosper. Mohammed E and Luna the Cat mutually appreciate his Omega Constellation Globemaster, which I need to remind you exists and is a great full bracelet sports watch option these days. Michael M of San Diego marvels at the loom on his Panerai Luminor Marina, which he mentions was his first luxury watch. And Steve R. celebrates his rare Omega Milestone 1941 chronograph, which was museum collection number nine. I am loving those triple braced lugs. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list and give me your Instagram handle when you do. What else is going on right here? James Fernandez saying of Hermes, the H decoration is kind of their deal though. Time Hill opining Hermes saddles. Right here, Paul Goldstein saying, Dan Reuter watches. I'm ordering the Tim Masso version. Beautiful watches, great value. That's right. If you're on the Talking Time with Tim Masso Facebook group, we're doing a discounted group watch order with customization from Dan Reuter of New York. He's going to give a lifetime warranty and a 10% discount to everyone who orders the Tim Masso group watch. All right. What else is going on? We have Suki V saying he thinks that the Hermes costs stupid money and he prefers a contrast. All right. Fair enough. Everyone has an opinion. There are no right or wrong answers because this is a luxury. We're talking about things no one needs. What else is going on right here? Miroslav. Oh my God, that Omega. You're not wrong. That thing is one of the best of the museum series. Omega was doing vintage reissues back before that was cool and they did great ones. We got a friend joining in from Dallas, Omega Lover 214. And then right here, we've got Amit asking, is that Team Asso Reuter watch only in blue? No, there will be several color options as well as strap customization. And we got Kevin Hawthorne, greetings from Lakeland, Florida. All right, jumping into another question you asked, is Audemars Piguet too dependent on the Royal Oak and its derivatives? Most industry estimates indicate that AP's revenue and profits are 90% or more derived from the Royal Oak and the Royal Oak Offshore collections. That leads to two sub-questions. First, is AP really that dependent on the Royal Oak? Because it sounds kind of damning when you say over 90% of the profits comes from one model line. Second, the question that we need to answer is, is there anything wrong with that? Well, I'm going to say yes. AP, in answer to the first question, AP really is that reliant on the Royal Oak. Think of all the dress watches we've seen come and go. Uh, I remember back in the 90s, AP had a line called the Classic Series. That was joined by the Millinery in 1995. Classic Series became Jules Audemars in the 2000s. Jules Audemars went away in 2019. For a period, we had the Edouard Piguet collection of rectangular and non-round dress watches, all of which is to say we've seen a lot of failures, and the tepid launch of the Code 1159, as well as the low consequent volumes, leads me to wonder whether it will ever be economically consequential for Audemars Piguet. And I wouldn't be shocked if after Audemars Piguet Code 1159 Mastermind 
Francois Henri Benamia leaves next year in his final year as CEO. I wonder whether there's going to be as much of an impetus to maintain that collection and continue to develop it. It might be something of an orphan at that point. So yes, Audemars Piguet is very dependent on the Royal Oak and the Offshore. But the second question is more important. The second question is, is there anything wrong with that? And I'm going to say no, there's not. How many brands struggle to launch and sustain more than one successful model line? Heck, how many brands struggle to launch one truly iconic and successful model line? I would say most of them struggle in that regard. Plus, I would also say this. Speaking of model lines, it's not fair to look at the Royal Oak as just one model or two models, if you include the offshore. The reality is, yes, Audemars Piguet and the Royal Oak are now one. It's like the Lich King and Arthas. They merged, they became one entity. But there's nothing wrong with that when Audemars Piguet's volumes are likely to hit 60, even 70,000 in the next six years. Remember, when Francois Henri joined, they were like 25, 30,000 units, which is to say, even even as their model lines have more or less contracted into one or two, they've also more than doubled their volume, so they're not hurting for lack of a classical dress watch. The basic Royal Oak Jumbo is, frankly, AP's long-sought successful dress watch line. It's hiding in plain sight. We just need to consider these jumbos, whether 15202, 16202, or the perpetual calendar derivatives, to be dress timepieces, especially in precious metal form, like the white gold salmon dial. This is an elegant, thin, and versatile dress watch. And truly, they're pushed down crown, they're relatively fragile, they're exceptionally thin, they're very elegant, they fit underneath the cuff. These are dress watches. It's definitely more interesting interesting, you have to admit, than just about any Vacheron Patrimony or Patek Calatrava. I can be honest, among all of those options, if this is the alternative, I want this. Honestly, would you rather have this or like a Calatrava 6119? I know my answer, and I'm a big Patek fan. I'd rather have this. And the ultra-thin perpetual calendar is another example of how the Royal Oak went from being a sports watch in the early 70s to a dress watch in the presence. This is ultra-thin. This movement is 2.89 millimeters thick and automatic. This watch is a GPHG laureate. It's a GPHG Aguidor winner, the grand prize at the Oscars of watchmaking. The whole watch is only 6.3 millimeters thick. In spite of the fact that it's modular, the perpetual calendar complication is less than half a millimeter thick. It is genuinely impressive in any way. And it makes the otherwise, frankly, attractive Code 1159 perpetual calendar look like an Hublot Big Bang by comparison. And I like this watch, but the problem is, at over 50 millimeters across the wrist with a chunky canister of a case, these are huge watches for the dress watch class. And while they're very appealing, and more so since the 2020 dial redesigns, the fact is, if you want AP's best dress watch, it's not the Code 1159. It's some ultra-thin Royal Oak variant. Now, you want to go swimming? Well, we have the offshore diver for that. There is no equivalent overseas diver or Odysseus diver or Aquanaut or Nautilus diver. This is something in the haute horlogerie segment that has very few rivals. I would say it's basically this and the Blanc Pain 50 Fathoms in the mainstream. Yes, there are smaller brands, there are more specialized options, but in the mainstream, the two neighbors, Audemars Piguet and Blanc Pain, pretty much have cornered the market. This is a dive watch that has almost nothing in common with the Royal Oak Jumbo or the perpetual calendar you just saw. Yeah, they've got the same bezel shape, that's about it. They are from different worlds and they serve different purposes. Do you want to run laps? Do you drive a race car? Well, we have the Royal Oak Chronograph for that, and there are many wonderful variants of it. Get it in 42, get it in 44, get it in 43. New movements are available, new dials are available, new straps with quick release lugs are available. AP invests in these lines. While it may be overly dependent on the Royal Oak, it is never complacent, and it is always advancing your options, as well as the features you get within those options. I would also go so far as to say there are niche opportunities with jewelry Royal Oak variants if that's your game. There are ladies versions as well. Remember, that is a jewelry watch, but it's not a women's watch. That is haute horlogerie, a métier d'art option. And yes, there are métier d'art Royal Oak options, so that base is covered as well. There are the Royal Oak concept watches to provide brash, high-mech alternatives for those who consider independence, like Grubel Forcey, Erver, Gromagotier, MBNF, or even AP's junior partner, Richard Mille. In other words, AP is ready and willing 
No matter your wrist size, no matter your taste, the only common thread is they share a bezel shape. Oh, and if you want to play, bring money and be ready to wait. All of which is to say, there isn't really any blindside product category for rivals to steal sales from AP. There's no weakness in the product line where one of AP's rivals can say, hey, Audemars Piguet doesn't play in that segment. We better take advantage and steal their lunch. Ain't gonna happen. What market segment, after all, isn't addressed by the Royal Oaks and the Offshores? It's an open question. Let me know. What's going on in the box? Edwin C. saying, hey, Tim, the best thing about pulling an all-nighter for work is catching you live. Greetings from Singapore. Thank you so much for staying up super late and watching me. And then right here, Shane D. saying, why is AP's two-watch reliance still created so much price growth versus Omega with the Seamaster and Speedy? Just volume? AP realizes that the last two years have been exceptional, and it's taking everything it can get. That's why it's gone from almost 500 doors to, like, I don't know, 120 to 150 right now. And they're going to go almost full vertical. They're going to pare that down by about another third. And that's all about creating waiting lists and selling watches at full list. Remember, AP was one of the first brands to openly say that they were only going to hold recommended price brackets and offer those to dealers and factory boutiques. They were not going to make them mandatory sale prices. So whereas a Patek dealer pretty much has to sell you the watch at retail, and a Rolex dealer pretty much has to sell you the watch at retail, AP, including out of its factory stores, is willing to charge market price. So if you've ever seen a markup on like a Mercedes Geländewagen, where it's $300,000 plus a market adjustment of $300,000, AP might be doing that soon. And remember, AP has a couple of retailer models, independent retailer, Joint Venture, AP Boutique, and then the Ultralux AP Houses, which are kind of like off-the-grid clubhouses where you can go and live the lifestyle. So they are trying to add some measure of value to the buying experience. It's just going to get a lot harder and more expensive to get the product. We have a friend joining in from Krakow in Poland, Jonathan Ornstein, a regular viewer. And then Amit K asking, is there any way to get in on the Reuter group without a Facebook account? I'm not a fan of Facebook. Neither am I. I only have an account in order to manage my Facebook group. Yeah, reach out to Dan Reuter, tell him it's part of the Maso group buy, and he'll give you the options and the pricing structure. Eric Nielsen saying, AP is a great house of watchmaking. Once the hype watch description moves on to other brands, they will be appreciated again for horology and finish, and I agree with that. We have BNS saying, Danny Rubin, that Blanc Pat is good looking watch. Doubt it's under 10 grand though. And then Martin H saying, if you are a collector and you're not a fan of the Royal Oak, can you pretty much forget about AP? No. Vintage AP, and I consider anything pre 2000 to be vintage, should still be interesting to you. The John Schaefer jump out, John Schaefer shaped jump hour minute repeaters, the star wheels, the tourbillon automatique, all of the vintage ultra thin perpetual calendars from the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, the millinaries, the Jules Audemars, the Edouard Piguet, the pocket watches from the early 20th century and 19th century. Don't ignore these watches. These are great watches from wonderful eras in the history of one of watchmaking's great brands. There was an AP before the Royal Oak, and it's worth collecting, and it's worth your attention. All right, jumping back in. Another question, Tim, why are you so tough on Audemars Piguet in your reviews? You're not nearly this critical of Langa, Vacheron, or Patek, because I have higher standards for a brand I love, and I really do love AP. As critical as I am about them sometimes cheapening the product, increasing their production volumes, or over-relying on one model line or model lines, I really do love Audemars Piguet, and I fell in love with AP before I fell in love with Patek Philippe, independent brands, Jager, Le Coult. Honestly, AP to me represents the best of Swiss and sometimes when your hero lets you down, even if it's only in a small way, you take that more seriously than if, well, Joe Schmo happens to offend your sensibilities. So AP, I love you. I know there's some great people working there who I think the world of and admire as my horological heroes. I'm not going to name names, but I think they know who they are. So AP, I love what you've been, I love what you are, and I will always hold you to the highest standards, even if I sometimes sound a little bit like a chiding school marm. Okay, viewer wrist shots number three. Jimmy Y and his Panerai Luminor Submersible PAM683 are at America's Grand Canyon in Big Sky Country. Adam R. climbs Mount Whitney with his Rolex Explorer for a long day of hiking at altitude. Tony C. and his Damasco DC56 enjoy the outdoors with his Radwagon for e-bike, which I love. 
Adam and Sarah posted his and hers with Grand Seiko and Hamilton in San Diego. We've got a couple of San Diego denizens in the chat box. Brian A. of Anchorage, Alaska showcases his Zodiac Aerospace GMT looking good. Brian, send your wrist shots and your Instagram handles to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Give us your Instagram handles so we can tag you if you're included. A question from the field, and this is a tough one. Tim, do you even like watches anymore? What happened to the guy from 2014 to 2018 who owned Torbjorn, Perpetual Calendars, Alarms, Dress and Sports watches, and even Vintage? Why have you only worn two watches in the last four years? Guys, I got to admit, I have constant second thoughts about what I did in 2018. When I thought I was leaving the watch industry, I wanted to burn the ships and cut the cord. And today, I do regret selling my whole JLC collection. I would have kept, at the very least, my Duomet, which was my dream watch for four years before I bought it and for all of the four years that I owned it. That was an all-time great, possibly the most interesting version of JLC's most interesting watch, and prior to my Dan Reuter, with which it is co-equal, the most accurate mechanical watch I ever owned. I also should have kept my Grand Memovox, a 41.5 Platinum Edition of 250 pieces that included a lovely bronze gong with wonderful resonant volume and sustain, and a perpetual calendar. All of this built on a JLC Memovox base. This was a wonderful watch, and I think of all of my watches, this is the one that got the most rich wrist time. Both the Duomet and the Grand Memovox were full set, and they were personal favorites. I would say of the 10 JLCs I had, 50% of the time, one of those two watches was on my wrist. Now, I still have my E877 Snowdrop. It's coming back from a full JLC factory restoration, and this, this September, it will be re-entering my rotation. So I haven't given up on JLC or watch collecting, and frankly, if I had stayed in the watch collecting game, I would have sold my refinished naked, no box, no paper, Amvox 2, and I would have bought an unpolished, full set Amvox 2. That, the two high horology pieces, and the snowdrop would have been my four JLC pieces and the anchor of my collection. Now, I have to admit, watchmaking is more important to me these days than watch owning. I consider the skills to be sort of like my graduate degree. I've been doing this for eight years, and yet I feel like I don't have a professional certification or skill or, or a real professional credential of any kind. And while I certainly know my watches, I'm not sure that there is a graduate version. Like, I don't think there's like a Megazord version of me. Like, you remember, like Power Rangers, they had these robots, and then the robots would combine like, ult like you know, like Ultron, not Ultron, Voltron, sorry. Would combine like Voltron, not, not a new idea in Japanese TV, but you know, there's no Megazord version or Voltron version of like what I do on YouTube. So for me, watchmaking is that next step. It's, it's the elevation to a higher plane. And to me, that's the, pro the professional credential that I want. And so when you're focusing your money on tools that are expensive and you're focusing your time working on things and you know, trying to learn how to unbreak the things you broke when you were less experienced, you don't have as much time to shop and so when I've mastered those skills, I'll be back collecting in earnest. And that's really important to me because I feel like owning watches and mastering watches are both integral to what I do. And since I do plan to stay in the watch space for the immediate future, the next couple of years, I do want to have both the collector's chops, but then the expertise chops. I don't think just knowing a lot encyclopedically gets me there. I think I need the watchmaking. But watch collecting will definitely return. I think uh, constant access is also a big deal for me. I see everything. As I mentioned earlier, I have recorded videos of not one, but two Philippe Dufour simplicities. We see everything at Watchbox. And you buy watches to have permanence in your life. That's what a lot of Silicon Valley and tech guys tell me, that they want the permanence that comes with owning mechanical watches. Well, for me, I definitely feel that, but permanence, in my case, comes from the knowledge that no matter what we have now, it will come back eventually. I never feel like I've got one opportunity and only one opportunity to experience a watch. If that were the case, if these encounters were few and far between, I would definitely buy more of the watches I love most, so I 
could keep them selfishly for myself and enjoy the fraternity of watch collectors who enjoy those brands, those models, those styles, and to be able to take the watch out anytime I like, look at it, wear it, and benefit from its features and its presence. I didn't have this incredible level of access when I was new to the collecting fraternity, and so I felt more of a need to buy stuff up and own it all myself. I don't feel that as much now, but I do feel like there will be a time to pick my moment and pick my watch. So my attitude toward independence has also changed immensely since 2018. My focus on what I like has shifted. Uh, there's Dan Reuter, who made my current watch in New York, and that was full custom, and I love the way it looks, I love the way it works. Uh, Garrick is now on my radar. Definitely check out the new S5, which just came out in the last couple of days. Vacheron and Longa won't customize a dial like that, that's for sure. And not all independents are de Batoon, Jorn, and Romain Gautier, with prices in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. So these days, you can be an independent brand connoisseur and never spend more than 10 grand and have a great time doing it. Value is a major selling point in the independent space today, and it's part of what attracts me to those kind of watches. These days, too, I tend to envision my hypothetical collection as an assembly of watches that mean more to me than their brands and those brands' larger collections. So I love the, the white gold Zeitwerk, but I don't necessarily want a collection of Longas. I want this Longa. I'm better able to focus on what I like than to try to erect goalposts or guideposts or rails that keep me on track. I know what I like enough that I can freestyle a bit and pick without having regrets. Moser. I like Moser, but I don't love most Mosers. I love the Streamliner Center Second. Vacheron. Again, I'm not a Vacheron fanboy, but the Saltarello, which featured a retrograde and a jump hour and Geneva Hallmark and the 1120 base, this is the best of everything Vacheron represents with a real rose lathe guilloche dial. That would be my Vacheron. And Breitling with the Premier B09. You saw it in the thumbnail, now you see it on your screen. This is my favorite Breitling by far. Its current production, its 40 mil lacquer dial, 100 meters water resistant despite obviously being a dress style, a manual wind adaptation of the B01, that's what B09 is, and at 40 millimeters and quite thin, this is a Breitling I can actually wear. Okay, so what comes next? Well, here's what I will own, and you can write this down. Hold me to it and chew my ear off the next Dubai Watch Week if I make myself out to be a liar. The Omega Gray side, this is the all time all the time watch for me. It's the watch I see as a daily driver because it's basically indelible and doesn't show marks of wear. Omega also claims you can swim with their 50 meter watches. I'm not gonna test the theory, but it's nice to know it's there. Platinum dial, ceramic case, coaxial chronometer chronograph movement. The 50 fathoms. You know I love it. I think it's the Cadillac dive watches, and I'm old fashioned, so I still think Cadillac means the ultimate. The Patek Philippe, 5235G regulator annual calendar. As good as it gets, this is the grail. Now, among independents, if I were to go out and buy an independent in the high end, David Walter has the most appeal to me. He's a very cool guy. He tends to build one unique watch and then move on, so photos of what he does are hard to find. And then, of course, some kind of a debatoon. We'll see. This is near real estate money for me, but this was my baby at Watchbox. When I had to fight for believers, I was a debatoon die hard. And the DB Digital with the jump hour, the moon phase on the case back, and the inline calendar is my ultimate debatoon. So, viewer wrist shots number four, Richard J. and his VW Golf R celebrate the Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter 007 edition. Looking good. Robin T. and his VW Camper enjoy Northumbria with his 2022 Zin Easy M 1.1S. Jake S and his strap-clad two-tone Rolex Explorer returned from Budapest by Suzuki. Tobias L. unboxes his Rolex Sea Dweller 43 in Phuket, Thailand, and Juan N. takes us home from Hallover Inlet in Miami with his Omega Seamaster Aquaterra GMT chronograph. Send your wrist shots and your Instagram handles to mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com. Time out, Tim out. Thanks for all you do, Sean, and thanks for you for making the best job in the world possible. Time out, Tim out.